Able to On Air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together, and Champlain Community Services of Vermont. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that for the past seven plus years in Vermont and beyond has been focusing on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the divinely able. I'm your host, Lawrence Seiler, and on, uh, before we introduce our guest today, I would like to thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and Champlain Community Services. With me on the phone is Tom McElvana, Executive Director of the of IAC New York City uh, Interagency Council for Developmental Disabilities. Um, thank you, Tom, for joining me again, uh, but this time in a different state on on the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Larry. Okay. Um, tell me the missions and goals of uh, the Interagency Council for Developmental Disabilities. Well, uh, IAC, as, as we shorten it up, uh, has been uh, uh, in, in business since 1977, and it's, it's, originally its mission was to help uh, not-for-profit providers that provide service to um, uh, organizations. Um, uh, they provide direct services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, and throughout the years, as the um, institutions in New York State uh, continued to be um, to be emptied, and uh, more uh, work and opportunities for people with disabilities in the communities began. Uh, many of our not-for-profit providers grew. Many of them were founded by parents in the 40s and 50s and beyond. Uh, so our mission really is to help create value for them mm -hmm. uh, and give them all the tools they need to succeed. But I think our short line is helping to make a better world for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. When you say, when you said be empty, uh, how long did it really take? Uh, I know about the Willowbrook Consent Decree, but how long did it really take for advocacy and parents to really get together to empty uh, uh, institutions for people with special needs? Because there are still 39 states, to be exact, that do have uh, developmental centers and institutions. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it, it's taken a while because it, it requires an investment uh, by government um, to close these institutions and to provide uh, the funds and resources for agencies either to um, uh, support people in, in you know, initially in the congregate care community-based services, but then also uh, creating mechanisms for people to be able to be on their own and uh, to, you know, function and live their life to, to what they want to have. Many states are still struggling with that. Um, uh, as we both know, we are aware that some states still have an institutional population. Um, many of the um, horrific uh conditions that existed um, uh, have uh, largely been, um, uh, you know, hopefully uh, been mitigated. People have, uh, have uh, you know, are aware now that, uh, that people, regardless of abilities, uh, should be able to lead lives of dignity and respect. So it, it took New York State, uh, you know, um, uh, there are now maybe not living in the old institutional buildings, but probably there's uh, probably a little, approximately 100 people or so that uh, are on the state grounds and uh, they're looking to place those individuals as in, in, in opportunities as best they can. So it took, it took 40 years of a partnership between government uh, and organizations willing to help support uh, people with special needs. What is the difference between, uh, since you say institution, what's the difference between a developmental center and an institution? Or is there both intertwined there somewhere? Well, you know, as you know, our society still has a, 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 a real, a real um, penchant for, like, 
making nicer titles out of what was. So Developmental Center for New York State uh, was, is the same interchangeable institution. Um, they used to be called state schools back in the day, um, back in the 50s, um, when many of the individuals um, were from the baby boom generation who uh, whose, um, whose parents uh, maybe were guided to place their, their, their child in that kind of uh, setting. Uh, so they call them state schools to make them sound uh, sound uh, like like such a nice place. Um, unfortunately, as it turned out, as we know, uh, they became um, uh, horrific examples of um, you know what uh, the lack of funding and the lack of oversight, and the lack of caring by society at large could do. Hmm. Um, in terms of how we became uh, well throughout history, um, you know, eighteen hundreds on. Uh, you know, people with special needs have been really, uh, they were treated, hor- you know, horrifically back then. Uh, words changed. Uh, they were uh, called infirmed, feeble, etc. Um, has it really changed as far as the, humani- the humanitarianism of people with special needs? Yes or no? Yes, I, I think it has uh, tremendously. I, I think people have, uh, you know, understood that uh, along with the civil rights movements um, for people of color in the '60s, uh, for for women, uh, uh, for LGBT, uh, LGBT. Um, uh, Q folks uh, over the last number of years, people are, are are recognizing that each individual person, regardless of ability, regardless of circumstances, regardless of your cultural religion, uh, should have the right to, to live your life uh, to, its, to its fulfillment as you see it. So I think things have changed. Now, you know, attitudes towards, towards um, people with disabilities, for example, in the workplace, we'd like to see more opportunities for people to be able to work. Um, you know, there's still, you know, many miles to go to get more uh, beyond from community-based to even more individualized uh, opportunities for people. But uh, so progress has been made. Um, but uh, like anything else in society, we're always a work in progress, uh, whether it's personally or on, on a larger scale. Uh, but I think we've come quite a long way. In terms of services with IAC, um, how do you guys help with um, the training of staff with um, group homes and other agencies? IAC has a, approximately uh, 130 members. Uh, these are not-for-profit agencies, mostly in the downstate uh, New York State region, but certainly throughout other parts of the state, upstate and western part of the uh, state as well. And our and our our we, f- we focus on helping to make them better by providing uh, training and technical assistance. Um, we work with government uh, to advocate for uh, policies uh, and uh, operational um, uh, inc- yeah, operational um, programs that will be able to, to uh, work better. We, we, take, we carry the voice of uh, provider members, but we also work with parents. We also work with self-advocacy and, and the Direct Support Professional Alliance in New York State, and we advocate uh, um, for not only policies, we also advocate for the funding resources necessary. So we, uh, on an annual basis, we uh, meet with our local uh, and state officials, uh, both in for the adults uh, with intellectual development of disabilities and for children in special education programs. Uh, probably about 30 to 40 percent of our providers also have special education schools. And in our not-for-profit special education schools, we uh, hope to carry the message that children with special needs uh, should receive the same resources as children that do not have special needs in that way. So uh, it's an ongoing battle, but we try and support our members through tra- through the information and training and technical assistance, as well as legislative and political advocacy. Uh, in terms of um, DSPs, because I know here in Vermont with DSPs, um, there are agencies that have them. Um, but exactly how has the DSP movement, direct support professional movement uh, with staff changed or not changed uh, through the years because DSPs way back used to get paid um, seven something an hour um, as much as an aide would 
Um, but how has that changed with uh, how, uh, as time went on? Well, certainly uh, as 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 um, more programs and services for people with disabilities uh, continue to be developed over the years. Um, we recognize that uh, the the people, the direct support professional who works with them directly, it was the key to quality of service. The parents understood it. Those of us who began in, in, as DSPs understood it. Um, and there's going to be a continued demand for more community-based services, uh, which really means that we have to continue to push government to provide the investment uh, necessary. Um, the DSPs' wages today, while they... Uh, uh, in certain states, uh, New York State, for example, we had a campaign called Be Fair to Direct Care, which was able to get raises uh, as the minimum wage was increased. Uh, DSPs who have been making more than the minimum wage were now finding themselves making just minimum wage. And this kind of work is not minimum wage work. This kind of work is, uh, uh, is, is, has to reflect the amount of skill, the level of skill that's needed to fulfill the requirements can of you, the job. Can you elaborate on that in terms of the amount of work that DSPs have to endure? Well, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to get the quote right, but uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, you're as a DSP, you're certainly going to have to be able to uh, understand each individual person at, at that person's particular uh, skills as well as needs. So whether a person needs physical hand-on care, uh, help with transferring to and from uh, a bed to, to, to a chair, to, to a toilet, or whether the person will need feedings, or whether that person doesn't need the physical assistance but also needs uh, assistance in other activities of daily living, or actually being able to go out and help support that person as they negotiate the world through travel training and through um, uh, uh, negotiating and, 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 and uh, paying for their paying for their, their food and, and paying for transportation and uh, learning um, and, and working with the person, learning what that person's needs are and help better to support them. So you have to have, uh, you know, learn how to administer medication, learn how to deal with someone who has severe behavioral challenges. So it is across the board, not just custodial care. This is care design with a skill in mind uh, and uh, many different skills in mind all at the same time. Um, now, I completely understand that, you know, if people go into being DSPs, um, that they shouldn't be really in it for the money because it's not a money-making, you know, uh, it, it's having a heart, correct? So, uh, in terms of, uh, long and short of it, in terms of the field of special needs, um, what are managers really looking for, or what are people that are hiring people really looking for when uh, you hire people who want to work in the field of special needs? Well, you, you really off the bat more more than anything else, and even though there is you know the the dreaded paperwork and 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 the accountability expectations are so high because everything is data driven, and when you uh, with, with the amount of money that government um, invests mostly through Medicaid in, in in the services that we provide, so certainly all of that you have to have the skill to be able to document and articulate the um, you know what happened with the individual and their response to the support they got. But, but the first thing you really need off the bat is you need, you need someone with passion and belief in the mission that people with intellectual developmental disabilities uh, need supports where they are uh, to, for them to live their life. It makes, you know, I as, as someone who started in that way, uh, uh, I recognized from that point that I learned as much and, 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 and got so much more working with people with special needs than, than I was even able to give. So you, you do need that sense of passion and commitment that they want to do this work in supporting people. Uh, many folks who come to us have, um, you know, disability, uh, folks with disabilities in their own families, so they feel it and understand that commitment. Um, you need that first. Um, uh, and that is not always hard to do because the work is not is not easy. It is hard work. 
Um, but it, but the fulfillment and the, the the sense of income, the psychic income, so to speak, as you would get for it, uh, very often outweighs the check. But mm-hmm. ultimately, at the end of the day, you also need the, that person to be able to live and support themselves and have a living wage, mm-hmm. which is what we've been fighting for. Mm-hmm. Uh, being the fact that you've been in the field for 42 years, did you know what you were really getting into when you first started um, working with people with disabilities? I had no idea. <laughs> no, I'm, be honest. Go ahead. I, I, was, I was finishing uh, a stu- my student teaching um, for, to, for elementary education when an opportunity came up and I was able to, you know, work my student teaching around. So I, for a, well over a year, year and a half, I was, uh, uh, I was a live-in, it was kind of a house parent model. We, uh, we, I lived in a residence, um, we, we lived together for, um, um, there was a larger residence, folks who had come from the Willowbrook State Institution downstate New York here. And um, it, it, it um, to me, uh, the passion and belief in helping and support people and recognizing that, uh, as, as you like to say, uh, Larry, they're, they're differently able. Um, you know, that there are stories of people that I work with who could find find a solution to a problem faster than I could. So, mm-hmm. um, and that caught me and 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 continued to fuel my, my belief. Uh, we, I worked in organizations that were founded by parents and to, to feel the passion and belief of parents in their children, um, even as they became adults, uh, became uh, my passion as well. Uh, in terms of, um, as far as uh, group homes are concerned, because I know here in Vermont, um, there's a, what they call live-in providers, or w- where if a person wants to um, live, uh, if they want to live on their own, but they need a little assistance, they live with a family and then they're given a stipend. Uh, f- you know, for supplies and food and clothing and stuff like that. Uh, do you guys have that in New York, or how does that work? Uh, or is there more group homes than live-in providers? Well, New York State, because of the court order to uh, depopulate all of the institutions, there was a big push to develop lots of group homes, also called congregate care residences. So there are many throughout the state. Um, and I couldn't give you a number off the top of my head, but uh, but there is probably over 50,000 people in certified residential opportunities. Uh, many of them have been converted to more supportive living through a supportive apartment program. And now New York State has, has um, begun to embrace um, opportunities such as shared living, uh, as well as more independent living, we called in Individualized Support Services, ISS, mm-hmm. where they individual would get some rental support, for example. Um, and uh, there's also called self-direction services where individuals may or may not have 24-hour um, oversight and care and support. Um, we have folks that maybe have physical disabilities but still want to live on their own um, and maybe with some additional supports in the home, either through um direct support staff or also maybe some personal care services from the local county or city that they can um, be able to, to sustain a more independent life. Um, you know, we look to try and create as many individualized situations as possible to respond to what the person wants. So mm-hmm. it's taken some time to do that because we still have a fairly large population in certified residences. Um, and many of them are aging. So we're, we're almost a victim of our own success. Speaking, yes, we have people who are speaking oh. about aging, what really happens, I, I'll give you a prime example. Um, which, uh, um, there was a, an instance where, uh, I, mean, I mean, you know him, Luis Torres. He was working as a manager, and, sure. and there, was a, uh, there was a situation where a client, not mentioning names, of course, where a client was aging out, and then that person had to go into a nursing home. So what, what really happens when a client or a person with a special need really needs other services, a nursing home uh, 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 or another residence that the state, that o- OPWDD or, or cannot really provide? What happens then? Well, you know, it, it is, I guess, 
uh, as I was going to allude to, it was being the victims of our own success, where people who life expectancy uh, has go, that they are living far beyond it. Uh, so many people living with chronic illnesses, uh, uh, other physical disabilities, or uh, those kinds of things, as well as the general population. And what happens in the general population? Sometimes individuals need to move into a nursing home. Sometimes they are cared at home and with family. For people with disabilities, for example, in many of the residences, uh, many folks have had chronic illnesses and are able to remain there. We're able to provide additional supports and services in um, in the in the residence, uh, and we have been successful. People have battled chronic disease and have passed away in, in their own homes in those residences. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a, an understanding that it is their home until it, they can no longer support them. Uh, some folks will, may have more uh, more physical and nursing health, nursing home or nursing needs that can't be met in their residence. But so we're, we're, uh, we try not to look at the nursing home as a solution, um, but um, sometimes families also support you know that decision uh, as well. So we kind of have a you work as a team. You work as that person's circle of support to determine what's going to be best for that person with the person's uh, with the person's own desire and voice being the loudest. Um, okay. Since we said nursing home, I know this is a part of life. Uh, what happens within uh, let's say a group home situation uh, within your agency, and, and if a person has no. Um, no family whatsoever, uh, and I've I've touched this on many of my shows before. Um, what happens then? How do, how does the person's burial get taken care of through the state? Uh, do you guys, within as a council or as an agency, help with that situation? How does that work? Uh, you know, because it's part of life. Sure, it is. You're right, and and. We, as people begin to age, uh, we start to engage in planning. We, we have those as part of our discussion if a person develops some kind of illness or, or, or a chronic condition, or if they're getting to an advanced age where we see skills that are being lost, uh, we look to see whether or not the residents can support them. You know, is there an accessible entrance? Is there an accessible bathroom and uh, a room on the first floor? Which sometimes we have done, we have moved, um, we have moved folks within a residence. If a person is living at home, uh, maybe just getting uh, of those kinds of supports, you know, is it, a, is it a walk-up residence? Is it an elevator building? Can we provide through a care management, now it's called care management, it used to be called service coordination. We really look to make the adequate plan for the person. Um, and to see whether or not they can remain where they are, just like many folks want to remain in their own homes as they get older, mm -hmm. uh, or not they're going to need more uh, uh, physical and health supports that another kind of facility will give. So every situation is individual, but it also is really the, the, the key issue is really to plan in advance and to, and to have that in place with the person and any person and any of their advocates as well, whether they have family or someone else who is advocating for them. Um, what are the future goals of your agency and, and, and how do you guys see within the uh, 21st century? Because, you know, we're, we're getting into some really heavy politics with um, our current administration and our current administration is not really in favor of people with special needs and services. So how, how do you see how you see your, yourselves in the future? Well, we uh, are as as good as our members uh, can help sustain us. I mean, we, we rely on uh, you know income from from our training and special programs that we do put on, uh, which includes uh, online training as well as in person training. You know, we have uh, dues from our members, um, and and our health is really directly tied into theirs. Uh, and we know it has been, the challenge has been difficult. Uh, government in general, because uh, whether it's from the, the suffering from the Great Recession of 08, or whether the, the and in many cases, government not continuing to support agencies uh, through the inflationary increases that we all see. Um, and uh, so they're 
they're really financially, they, it is a very tough time for many of them. So uh, we continue to support for them, which is why we have to advocate. We have to advocate in, in Washington to uh, indicate that Medicaid is not a welfare program, that Medicaid is a support program that provides long-term care and services, and, and it provides health insurance uh, for the nation's poor, uh, the sick, and those who have disabilities. So we have to get and understand that even as you spend Medicaid for, for a person, if they are living more on their own because of Medicaid supports, that saves taxpayers money. The fact that even in, even in residential and other day services and employment services, we employ staff to help support people. Those staff are employed, they in turn pay taxes, so we have a, an economic positive impact for the use of Medicaid dollars in our communities throughout our states. Is country. it all paid? Uh, so we got to convince them of, we got to convince our legislative uh, leaders of that. Is, uh, 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 is the services for people with special needs all paid through by Medicaid? No, there, there's a number of different sources. Uh, Medicare certainly is also a big support. Two-thirds of, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have both Medicare and Medicaid. So it gets pretty complicated. Uh, there are other supports as well in terms of um, income, uh, SNAP, which is really the old, uh, which is for uh, supplemental f uh, food uh, needs of the population. So there's a number of different things that are pieced together. Um, for many of the services in New York State, especially in the uh, larger um, larger congregate settings, that is all funded via Medicaid. Uh, so for there, we have to make sure that our local and state governments understand the work we do, the importance of the work we do, the value that we bring to communities, and that it is not just throwing taxpayer dollars away, but it is taxpayer dollars that are then reinvested. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to thank you for joining me on this edition of uh, Able to On Air, Tom. And um, uh, and we'll be talking again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Larry. I appreciate it, and all the best. Uh, real quick before I end, what is the address and phone number in case anyone's on the website um, on our website? What's the address and phone number that people can reach you guys? Well, our our address is uh, it's IAC or Interagency Council. It's one fifty West Thirtieth Street, mm. New. York. New York, 10001, and the real quick and easy way is our website, which is iacny.org. Okay, thank you so much. This puts an end to this edition of Able to On Air. Uh, for more information on on, um, on IAC, you can go to www.iac, is it iac.ny.org or... That's correct. Okay. That's www.iac.ny.org. And uh, for those who want to um, reach us by um, website, you can go to www.orcamedia.net and look up Abled and On Air. And this puts an end to this edition of Abled and On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Thank you for, to our sponsors, uh, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and Champlain Community Services. Thank you, and uh, this puts an end to this edition of Able Dead On Air. I am Lauren Seiler. See you next time. on air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services empowering neighbors with disability to be home in the community also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services where hope and support come together and Champlain Community Services of Vermont